Many feminists of the 20th century argued vociferously and passionately the terrible events such as wars, stock market collapses and mass unemployment could be put down to the failures of men. Could be put down to men wanting to prove a point over other men. Of male egos bursting out of control. Of men failing to listen to conciliatory approaches that stereotypically would come from women. So much has been written about Shakespeare's Hamlet over the centuries. But how much has been written about its terrible multiple tragedies being largely caused by the failures of men and of their blind inability to listen to or even consider at any second the feelings and viewpoints of their female counterpoints? Stay tuned, you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Early on in Hamlet, men are seen to dismiss women's judgments. In Act 1, Scene 2, Hamlet muses on his mother's remarriage and declares pompously in a soliloquy, Frailty, thy name is woman. This line is interesting on so many levels. Firstly, there is the unspoken assumption that his mother has remarried because of her weaknesses, her frailties, rather than due to any overwhelmingly positive feelings of love or possibly selfless, but probably misguided, notions of Denmark being better served by both a king and a queen. However, what is also revealing is the broad and ridiculous generalisation made by Hamlet. Because his mother has come across as frail in this hasty wedding, therefore all women must be similarly weak and incapable. Extraordinary. Preposterous. Hamlet's withering indictment of his mother continues in this ponderous soliloquy when he declares, Oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, and in doing so degrades and dehumanises his mother further. She has moved from being a typically weak female to someone shamed by a rude, crude animal used to working on instinct rather than measured judgment. The use of the word beast to make an implicit comparison is particularly disrespectful towards the woman who carried him inside her for nine months and has loved him ever since. It conjures up images of teeth, savage eyes, killing other animals, rather than the kind, patient, loving figure symbolised in lines such as Sweet Hamlet and Oh my dear Hamlet. Sir Hamlet is quick to pass judgement and dismiss his own mother all because she has chosen not to be a widow, but a married woman once again. But he is not the only key male character in the play to feel that a woman cannot possibly make rational judgments. In Act 3, Scene 1, Claudius and Polonius cruelly use Ophelia, the beautiful, vulnerable young lady in love with Hamlet, as a pawn to gather an insight into Hamlet's behaviour. They inform her that the pair of them will hide behind an arras in order to eavesdrop on her private conversation with the young prince. Claudius says, Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves that seen unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge. Just as Hamlet's words in Acts 1, Scene 2 contain arrogant assumptions about women, so Claudius seems to institutionalise male wisdom and superiority in the lines, lawful espials, spies protected by the laws of the country, written by men of course. Ophelia's own feelings and thoughts on Hamlet's state of mind are not to be considered, are to be completely disregarded. This disinterest in the female voice, in female feelings, ultimately has tragic consequences. Claudius and Polonius do indeed eavesdrop on Ophelia's conversation with Hamlet, in which the latter is crude, rude and terribly disturbing. He tells Ophelia repeatedly to get thee to a nunnery, leaving her emotionally crushed. Yet, after Hamlet's departure, 
And when Ophelia is alone on stage with her loving father Polonius and Claudius, she is almost completely ignored. The only reference to Ophelia is her father's abrupt question, to which she notably doesn't wait for a response, How now, Ophelia? Which is quickly followed by the lines, You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said, we heard it all. So what are the tragic consequences of men battling to get one up on other men and using and debasing women in the process? What is the result of merely using Ophelia as a tool, as a tool to understand a fellow male's strange and potentially dangerous behaviour better? Well, the consequences are that Ophelia goes mad and dies. Surely both of these terrible events caused to a large extent by her female isolation. Even when her madness becomes clear in sexualised, unfeminine, unladylike, unophelia-like songs such as Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock, they are to blame. The men's pitiful response comes from Claudius, who sends Horatio after her with the words, Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. The key word is the noun watch, implying Ophelia and women in general are objects to be looked at. Admired for their beauty, perhaps, but not listened to or really considered as articulate, rational human beings. Just as Claudius and Polonius do not contemplate the thought of trusting Ophelia to report on Hamlet's mental state, she is too emotionally involved. She is a woman. So Gertrude is not thought to have the independence to be able to make a balanced judgment on her own son, in spite of knowing him intimately all her life, in spite of giving birth to him. The ironically unmanly interfering Polonius decides that tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should overhear the speech of vantage. In other words, women naturally have a poor judgment, naturally become taken over and consumed by their own emotions, which has a destabilising effect on their own minds, at least according to the snooper-in-chief man Polonius. And what is the consequence of Polonius' meddling and arrogant dismissal of the female minds? Death. Hamlet hears him shouting from behind the arras and kills him, initially thinking it was his evil, lustful uncle Claudius. Is it the king? If the judgment of women had been trusted, then unquestionably Polonius would have survived. The arrogance of men towards women drips through the whole play. You'll be doubtless pleased to hear. In particular, Hamlet introduces the extraordinary idea that women need men to help them understand their own selves better. During his fateful, supposed tete-a-tete with his mother in her private apartment, Hamlet declares forcefully, cruelly, patronisingly, You shall not budge, you go not, till I set you a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. This line sets up Hamlet, the male, almost as an omnipotent God, capable of seeing and understanding the deepest, darkest parts of other people's, or a woman's, humanity. The glass refers to a mirror that only Hamlet can metaphorically conjure up in order for his mother to understand her own evil weaknesses. In the world of Hamlet, then, women are seemingly incapable of self-contemplation, self-reflection. No, they need a man to do it for them, engineer a way to reflect for them. Whilst belittling and ignoring the female voice and the female ability to think, men in Hamlet also seem to fear female sexuality, female sexual desire. Hamlet seems particularly dismissive and horrified about what he sees as his mother's sexual desire for Claudius, for he refuses to call it love at your age. No, quite. His mind seems unable to get away from what he believes is his own mother's uncontrollable, evil, sexual lust. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an unseemed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Hamlet's mind is conjuring up images of sweaty, frantic bodies. In semen means soaked with grease, suggesting a gruesome, sticky sweat while stewed as a pun on the inmates of a brothel and sty suggests dirty pigs. This is horribly graphic. None of us like to think about our parents making love and yet here Hamlet is accosting his own mother with imagined details and dirty animal imagery. 
It is hugely disrespectful, particularly as Hamlet dominates the conversation like a typical man and refuses to give Gertrude the opportunity to give her side, her feelings. These are dismissed without being heard or considered. Man is right, woman is weak. And sure enough, Gertrude is incredibly hurt by her son's metaphorical bombardment. These words, like daggers, enter in my ears. The simile highlights her distress. Hamlet's crude insistence on describing his own mother's lovemaking has left her in physical, sharp, wounding pain. The male desire to attempt to control perceived unquenchable sexual appetite on the part of the female is seen when Hamlet gives advice and orders to Gertrude about her sleeping arrangements. Good night, but go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. Refrain tonight, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence. Hamlet's desperation to see to control is shown in his short, barking sentences and imperatives such as go not, assume, refrain. He wants to come across as authoritative and in doing so continues to assume that his mother has this unquenchable sexual thirst which she has no evidence for whatsoever. His words are extraordinarily patronising, giving Gertrude tips on how to reduce this enormous desire of hers, little by little, step by step. Of course Hamlet is only sticking up for his father, men looking after men, in his insistent desire to monitor and restrain his own mother's supposed sexual desires. His father, appearing as a ghost in Act 1, Scene 5, reflects, So lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. The verb sate refers to becoming becoming satiated, completely filled up with, and so suggest women, here Gertrude, are passive creatures at the mercy of abstract desires and forces too powerful for them to prevent or have any say over. This is made all the more terrifying and intimidating for men in that women may seem heavenly, may seem radiant angels, sleep in angel-like beds, yet can still be overcome by filthy, enormous sexual appetites. We've already seen how Ophelia dies due to men not giving her a voice, not trusting her, not listening to her. The same happens with Gertrude. In Act 5, Scene 2, Claudius has put poison in one of the goblets and aims to kill Hamlet with it should Laertes fail to do so. However, Gertrude has no idea about her supposedly loving husband's new plan and takes a generous sup herself. Claudius warns her, Gertrude, do not drink. She replies, I will, my lord, I pray you pardon me, before Claudius reveals in an aside, it is the poison cup, it is too late. And so the incompetence of men, the desire of men to show their own power, not just over women, but other men too, leads to the death of an innocent woman. Even following the death of an innocent woman, the male ego cannot be contained. In Act 5, Scene 1, Hamlet and Laertes show their love for Ophelia at long, long last, but only forcefully, powerfully, when she is dead, resulting in a ludicrous battle inside her grave. They try to outdo each other over their love, with Laertes wanting to catch her once more in mine arms, before leaping crazily into her grave where her dead body lies. Meanwhile, Hamlet declares, I loved Ophelia, 40,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my son. Hamlet's words attempt to quantify the unquantifiable, put an arbitrary figure on something that cannot be measured, and so reduces the remembrance of sweet Ophelia to an undignified male ego fest. Hamlet is a complex play. However, the terrible, demeaning behaviour and attitudes held by men towards women contribute enormously to the final tragedies. To quote Marilyn French in her 1981 work, Shakespeare's Division of Experience, chaste constancy fails in one woman, leading Hamlet to damn all women. I would go one step further than that. Within the historical context of Shakespeare's patriarchal world, women are damned merely for being women. Good evening, thanks for watching.